Robin has taken me to all corners of the British Isles, and I've met some wonderful people and done all sorts of interesting things. Over the years, I've really enjoyed getting my hands dirty, learning about different traditional rural industries. I've loved meeting the men and women who are keeping little bits of our heritage very much alive. And coming up in the programme, I break my back dry stone walling, and I meet someone who might just have the best office view I can imagine. But firstly, when Floggett visited Shropshire, I took a trip into the countryside to meet a man who gives a whole new definition to landscape gardening. You see, this part of Britain is very strong in rural heritage, and hundreds of people still work on the land, keeping that tradition alive. And here in Bridge North in Shropshire, they're repairing the hedges. It's an art form which has survived centuries. Up until the invention of wire, it was the most economical and practical way of retaining livestock in a field. Like all rural crafts, the skill of hedge leg is an art form. And Carl Liebscher has been doing it for years. And he's going to tell me all about it. Hi, Carl. Are good you morning. Right there? <laughs> yeah, good morning. You're doing morning, a fantastic thanks. job. Look at that. Obviously, you're working in that direction. You seem to be felling or cutting these blackthorn or hawthorn trees. Yeah, mostly it's blackthorn. Mm -hmm. There's a big spiny thorns on there. So you basically yeah. you just lob them off at a certain No, we really touch the top. It's all, all the cuttings down there at the base here. Are you cutting but right through down there? No, we're only going about two thirds, three quarters of the way through. Um, there's enough bark and sapwood under there to keep feeding that tree. So and, will, and will this reshoot as well? Yes, e everywhere we've cut it here and yeah. where I've cut Florence from, just like pruning your rose. Pruning your rose, exactly. Yeah, you, you get new shoots coming up off here yeah. in, in the spring. So you, you, you're rejuvenating the hedge. And obviously exactly. making that a lot denser where you need it, so That's nothing it. can crawl through. No, no, no big hedgehog trees. So why are you laying the hedge, forcing it in one direction like that, and not this way? We're on a hip hillside here. I've started at the top of the hill and worked my way down. You know, when you think about it, if you try bending a tree one way or the other, if you lay it up towards the slope, you're not going to bend that tree quite as far, so you're not putting quite as much stress on, on, on the, the, you know, the wood yeah. that you're bending. So we always start at the top of the hill, and then work our way back down, laying the tree towards the top. Yeah. This is very labour intense, isn't it? I mean, how long has this section here? That's about two days' work. We're looking at that, about 30 metres of hedge ground. Gosh. Well, <laughs> you think it's slow, yeah. I mean, this is a bit of an old hedge. You, you, you get a nice young hedge, and you might be doing that in one day, 30, 40 metres in a day. How do you keep it stable? I've noticed you've got some sort of poles through the middle. Yes, I mean, the, the, the blackthorn does cling together very well, but we, we do put stakes in as, as well. In, in fact, um, we're just about ready for another one now. Uh -huh. the, these are um, hazel, right. cut from a, a local woodland. Well, we've got ash as well, put a point on the end. We just drop that in, lean it back at a slight angle against the um, trees that we've laid, and just drive that in a few inches. It's as simple as that. Yeah. <laughs> well, it must be very rewarding. It is. You must stand back and see that. Line. You're actually sort of um, drawing a line on the landscape yourself. You're, you're part of it. Gosh, look at these. <laughs> they look like lethal weapons. I'm going to get Carl to tell me all about them. Carl, <laughs> I think they date from the 19th century. They're quite early. Why do they vary in shape and size, and what are they called? Regional variations on, on, on a theme, really. Uh, and the, on this, this large one that I work with every day, that's, that's known as the Yorkshire bill hook. Yeah. This is a Bristol. Um, <laughs> that's a Norfolk. That's a Leicester. The small one on the end is, is, a, is a snapper. It's a story of evolution. I, I yes. think the local craftsmen working with local blacksmiths initially asking, you know, can I have a little bit more of a hook on this yeah. one, or a, a little notch on the top of one, you know, the yeah. technique he's using. Yorkshire one looks like you can get a little bit more sort of, well, a bit more yes, belly on the top. Exactly, it's got a bit more weight to it. It's almost like having a small axe, really. In Floggett tradition, I've got to have a little go. So, which bill hook can I borrow, please? Oh, I'll suggest the one on the end. <laughs> Carl's looking really <laughs> worried. <laughs> Keeps you fit. <laughs> the beautiful thing about hedge laying is effectively you're creating a living fence. 
which has huge benefits. It's a way of managing the trees. It provides a microclimate for new shoots to grow and also habitat for birds and other wildlife to live in. It's so environmentally friendly. Now, the only downside is, well, it takes two days to do 15 to 20 metres and it is hard work. And on wintry days like this, it's very important to keep another tradition alive and kicking, and that's the art of brewing up tea. Oh, thank you, Carl. It's good timing. Hedge lane isn't the only way of enclosing the land. In some parts of Britain, it's stone that's proved the better for raw material. In the Pennines, dry stone walls are used to manage the land. Dry stone walling isn't just of agricultural interest, in a sense. It's living history. It's a legacy to the movement towards the enclosure of common farming land and grazing land as English society moved out of feudalism. As individual landowners abandoned arable farming in favour of raising sheep and cattle, these dry stone walls were used to enclose parcels of land. They may look simple, but they're made with nothing but stone and the skill of the builder. Now there's something quite comfortably reassuring about the skills and techniques used in building these walls because they've stayed the same for centuries. I've come to meet Chris Wake, who's keeping this wonderful tradition very much alive. And he's around here somewhere. Hello, Chris. Hello. This is a stunning project. What is it? What are you working on? This particular project's for the local lady who has the guest house down there. She's decided that she wants it all very wall in. Uh, I presume just to make it more pleasant on the eye looking out of the house. And what do you think this was? I think it was probably a herb garden or maybe something for agriculture for little With animals and that. Yeah, livestock. Containing livestock. So when does it date back to? Probably a couple hundred years ago. Yeah. How did you get into this? I first started doing this when I was about 12, working on a local farm. So you're looking at about 20, 25 years now. That's a long time. How many miles of wall do you think you've built? <laughs> I would like to say. <laughs> that is I a lot. I would like to say, yeah. Probably from here, right around the Dales. I must say, the base is a lot wider than you think it would be. I'm just going to sit on your string line here. Now, do you use this principle the same as the modern day bricklayer? It keeps the wall straight and also you can find a coarse height. Yeah, that's what it's there for. It keeps it straight and as you're going up, it tapers it in a bit right. so it doesn't fall over. Is up. that why you need an A-frame like right. that? Yeah. So it just tapers into the right hand. Yeah. At the end, you know, at the top, like, it's, it's narrow enough to put your top stones on. But look at the size of these stones at the bottom. That's backbreaking. It's, uh, it's certainly hard work, and especially if you get through this size all the time. Yeah. And you wall it across the joint, like this. Always across the joint. Always across the joint, like you have two stones on top of one. Yeah. And if possible, always try and get your stones lengthways in, so they have more hold into the middle of the wall. Okay. End in, end out, that's how the saying is. It looks like they're all chopped into fashion and there's no cutting, is there really? There's nothing. No, not with this job. It's all natural stone. There's mm. little ham hammering, but not a lot. This section looks fantastic. You've obviously worked on this. Do you have to pull all of this down just to start again, or will you repair on top of what's left? No, it'll all come back down. Uh, it'll all be renewed. Right. Well, I'll tell you what, Chris. I've got to have a go. I've got to lay a few foundation stones here. I tell you what, I'm pleased with that. I think we've done quite well in such a short space of time. We've gone up a couple of courses and it looks great. Thatched cottages are an integral part of the British rural landscape. And maintaining these buildings is a traditional craft that dates back centuries. And as long as people continue to live in these cottages, we're going to need thatchers. Thatch buildings date back thousands of years, and it's generally agreed in this country, from let's say the Neolithic period right through to the late medieval times, that most buildings were thatched. And that's mainly due to the local resources being plentiful and affordable.
Until the 17th century, thatch was the most widespread form of roofing in Britain. But the wider availability of other materials, such as slate, meant declining thatching in the late 18th century. But thankfully, the industry didn't decline completely, and work still continues today at a steady pace for the 900 or so thatchers still working in Britain. One of those chaps who's keeping the tradition alive for future generations to appreciate here in Somerset is Master Thatcher, Lee Roadhouse. Lee, oh, yeah. nice to meet you. How did you get into thatching? Well, it's something I've always sort of fascinated by. I've always enjoyed sort of simpler sort of elements of life, so to speak. Um, I actually started fire making, which is, is these, when I was about 13. Mm -hmm. um, then started going holidays. Making. What are they for? These are the actual the, the hazel pegs that you actually can fix the roof on with. Right. Um, Twist them up. Oh, and that actually it. becomes it's like, like a cleat. Like yeah, yeah, just yeah. Sort of holds it all on. And it just like, progressed from there. Just carried on um, school holidays and then um, just went on as I left school. Well, this must bring back some memories because my notes tell me that you actually, when you're an apprentice, you actually worked on this very cottage we're working on now. Yeah, yeah, that was about 18, 19 years ago now. So can you see remnants of your past work here? <laughs> yeah, you know, but it's, it's funny. You, when you look around, nothing else has changed. And I think that's part of the fascination with this. It's, it's such a simple process, yeah. but so effective, and you're not baffled in science, and it, it, it works. It's quite labour-intense, isn't it? Very labour-intensive, yeah. <laughs> you do know when you know, you've done a day's work. <laughs> <laughs> it keeps you fit. Right, so we're up here. This would be the average size arm, would it? Yeah. And all the ears have to face upwards. Yeah. Get all your, all your really facing the same way. Um, you, you sort of literally sort of pitch it down. That's, that's basically squaring all, all the reeds so it's all down it's all to the out. bottom. Clean down. Yeah, that's right. You, you open up the reed, make sure there's no sort of cross line of reeds at all in there. And that just put it into place. And literally, you, you sort of put it back into sort of place with your hand just roughly. Yeah. I mean, you just gauged an armful, haven't you? Yeah. And that is incredibly neat. That is right to the right level. A lot of your work is it's, it's obviously all by eye. That's right, yeah. You, what you actually do is you try to keep a nice pitch on your reed, and then you have a, an imaginary line from the eaves to the ridge, and just work for that. These lines are very severe. I can look right across the ridge right now, and that is dead straight. Looking down there, that is such a beautiful angle. Yeah, and it's just literally just putting the line back in the sort of right angle of yeah. the, the line of the roof. And you, you try to slide it back into nearly the finished position. With a what? Uh, this is what they call a legged or a dress, and it's just usually like a back just to drive it back. And then that's in place, then you're fixing it to, to go on to the rafters. What a view! Yeah, what, what more can oh, you want? lucky chap. Yeah. I've been working away. Not bothered just by that, anybody. Just the pattern in enough to put a bit of cheese on the table. This is so therapeutic, isn't it? You can almost imagine yourself in medieval England up here. Yeah, it's, it's the same. Things just don't change. It's just, it's just lovely, isn't it? Yeah, we're joined by the geese down there, a few dogs and some cats <laughs> on the farm. <laughs> Ever fallen off? Me? Yeah. Not yet. Yeah. It's been fascinating stepping back in time and seeing how many of our traditional rural crafts are not just being kept alive, but are still flourishing. And what's more, I've loved helping out along the way.